This time we're going to have a special by Mandy and him up. Thank you, ladies, so very, very much. Is that powerful or what? Woo, y'all know what it's all about now. Then he take his show on the road. That, uh, that video, you know, that's what it's all about. People need Jesus. That's the answer. That's the answer for mankind. That's the answer for the Arabs. African Americans, Russians, you know, Caucasians, the answer is Jesus. Amen? It all starts with love. Now, um, I want to take just a few seconds here. Everybody in this room knows that the sisters love us, don't they? We know without any doubt. They love us. They show it. it it's love in actions. When you know the, when the sisters are in the house, there's love in the house. Right? So they, they say this, says, thanks to all of you for being so caring. The flowers are beautiful and the food was such a nice surprise. Everyone has been a true blessing to us. We are so fortunate to have such a loving church family. God's blessing to each of you with much love. Juanita, Joanne, as far as the food is concerned, and the preacher. <laughs> but I mean, guys, that's what it's all about. It's about loving on each other. You know? And this morning you heard me uh, in my prayer, you know, I don't know if y'all caught the news or not, but 
something's happening with, with our, uh, you know, we went over there into Iraq and had all these issues and, and started, started working with these, uh, you know, with this country. And now it seems like they have turned herself around and now they're going to start supporting Iran. I don't know how it's all going to come out, but, you know, it's all Bible. You know, there's, any way, there's no way that you can get around it. You know, God is, is getting ready to intervene and interact in a, in a certain way. You need to get your house in order. You know, get it. It's, it's, it's time. And then you heard me pray from Gould. And, you know, I've, um, I'm not a politician in some ways, but we all are in others. And so I've been trying to get involved with trying to tell the community, the people that I'm branching out to, the only way this community can be saved is if the Christian people step up. You know, it's going, you're going to have to get rid of politics, and Christians are going to have to step up and get involved. Okay? And that's the only way we can have it. Brother Dubs has, you know, asked me to get involved, and I've been wishy-washy one way or the other because I'm just not going to get in, in a political agenda. But there's something, things have been happening that's been exciting. I can ask the right questions, and I can make it come to a head because I'm an outsider, I'm a stranger. I don't know, and I want to know. So that gives me the lead way to ask. This, uh, I got a flyer that's going around. Do you pray about it? It's on uh, the 28th of this month. Uh, Brother Dubs is the co-chair of it. The, uh, you know, it's just going to be a meeting over here uh, at the um, Lions Club. Just supposed to come and eat and meet and eat and just get, just get to know each other. Have something going on besides politics. So you pray about it. You know, if you can come, just... We're going to just meet over there and eat and talk. It's, it's open up to the whole community. Whether one will be there or whether they're just the ones who are on this unity for the community, I do not know. But pray about it, guys, because, you know, this is our town. You know, this is where we live. And I don't know if you all have heard the uh, latest news, but there's something that's going on right now with not paying the bills and issues about the, uh, you know, the water bill you know our water we pay our water bill but the office the city office is not open and so they're not paying the what the money's being gathered but it's not being moved so that's an issue um, the trash you know that bill's not being paid you know if they do uh, turn off the electric for all the city lights not not our lights because we pay our bills but as brother Jerry said you know there is a possibility they could turn off the water pumps I don't know if that's just another political plot. I don't know. It's, it's always a mess, you know. Uh, I don't know. But you need to be in prayer. This is where we live. This is, this is where we, you know, this is, this is where we lay our heads at nights, you know. And, and those of you who live outside of town, well, it might affect your church, you know. We have no water or no sewer or things. So I don't know if it's just all political. They're just trying to make issues. But, you know, Iraq and Iran and Russia and all those in Israel, those are big issues. But so is our little town I live in. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a big issue because it affects me individually. So, so be in prayer about it. You know, Brother Dubs is, you know, he's trying to really wants to make a difference. You know, to say, hey, you know, he called me and said, preacher. He said, I know, you know, you're not political. You know, would you come and help me get involved? Just voice your opinion, you know. And, and here's my opinion. Here's what I told him. I've told him twice now. The only way this is going to work out and this town is going to heal is you're going to have to get the preachers involved from a Christian perspective and do things by this, led by this, with no political agenda. So just be in prayer about it. Amen? Amen. Because it's, it's, it's a very important thing. You know, we always put up on the screen before I get started here. You know, we, last week we, we teased Brother... Uh, Sean about being in, uh, sitting at a stoplight, and it was not a speeding ticket, okay? Uh, it was just fun. I said, man, the only man I know that get a speeding ticket sitting at a stoplight. It was got to deal with the tint of his window, and he hadn't done anything really wrong, so I made a big joke about it. But uh, we got one of those among us that's in a, a special club. Not everybody fits that club, but there's a few of us that are there. And Andy's about to join it. Hey, man, brother. The big 5-0, all right? So anything that y'all can do to harass him. Uh, so I saw it on the screen. Was it the 21st? 
Anything that you all can do to harass him or give him a hard time this, uh, this uh, week, you know, you make sure, you know. Did you take it hard? Are you, are, you're not there yet, but are you up and down? Are you, you good? You know, uh, my wife, when she turned 30, it became such an issue. I mean, you just do not know what we went through. And I live in a town that's where I was born and raised. It's bigger than this, of course. It's bigger than Dumas. And, you know, it's not as big as Pine Bluff. But when she turned 30, I mean, for six months getting to it, she got so tore up. I mean, you just do not know. I mean, she it wrecked the whole house. So guess what I did? I went in town and rented two or three billboards. I put ads in the paper. I put uh, these revolving signs that were in the, in the, uh, in the uh, jewelry stores and stuff. Everywhere that I could promote that Kay turned 30, I'm talking newspaper. It cost me hundreds of dollars. But it was one of the best jokes I ever played. I mean, she had, she's standing in the grocery store. And people come over and say, hey, happy birthday. She said, how do you know? And she said, you ain't been down through town, have you? <laughs> and boy, did she do. So are you, are you, you glad you're turning 50 or are you worried? Yeah. Amen. All right, guys. All right, so that's a, that's a lot of, of joking and seriousness. And let, let's get serious here for a few moments, okay? Honoring God's law. You know, this is honor God's law. We have a hard time with in today's society really discerning what honor is. Now, let, let me back up and give another commercial. I, ask, I, I pass out two different types of papers every Sunday morning. Are you keeping a notebook or are you just taking a sermon? You say, why do I need to keep a notebook? Well, because I'm taking a lot of time to type this. No, that's not the reason. In my house here and in Kentucky, I probably got 50 to 60 different notebooks. And you can go in my notebooks now and stuff that I've studied, that I've gathered over the years, that is just phenomenal. I'm, uh, if you come in my house right now, right behind my big easy chair, there's a, whole, a, a bookshelf full of these black and white notebooks. And I'm all the time getting them out and digging through them and seeing notes that I put down. Guys, it is a great resource. You know, and you need to have it. You say, well, that's for a pre you don't have to be a preacher. When you're studying God's Word and you want to learn and you want to know, okay, you know, you got something to go back to. The notebooks, you know, I, I do the, uh, if you only get two sheets, that means you're not keeping a notebook. If you're keeping a notebook, you're getting about eight sheets. So, you know, that's why I ask you, keeping a notebook or, you know, uh, you just listen to the sermon. Because it's very vital, guys, that you build resources that you would have tools. You, you take the time, all you ladies, I know you take the time to stock your shelves with can openers and gadgets to help you in the kitchen. Amen? You probably got in your kitchen drawer or somewhere in your house, you've got a drawer that you pull out that you get, you know, a little screwdriver or a tape measure or hammer, something that you can just get to really quick, right? You take time to set that up. Men, I know that you have got tool sheds where you, you know, you got a shovel and a pick and, you know, some of those good boy toys and things like that. We, we gather our toys, right? They're tools. You need to gather spiritual tools. You need to have them in your tool shed so when the time is right that you need them, you got a quick reference. Amen? So that's, that's my last commercial. Honor God's law. Well, today we have a hard time with understanding what honor is. You know, we, we've lost all total respect of it. Uh, we've done it by shaming some of our military who, is, who has honored us by shedding their blood. And right now there's an episode in politics that's saying that this um, area of, you know, leaks that are being leaked out from, you know, Washington that is putting our soldiers in arms way. You know, we've lost honor. What, what does honor mean? You know, we, we've lost all total concept. You've got children today that are growing up in the school systems. They have no idea what absolute truth is about anymore. We've lost some of those words. So how does honor and God's law come together one in one? Well, this is a love letter from God. This is really a history book. There's a lot of different tools uh, that is woven inside of this, if you will, from prophecy to how to have your marriage, finances, relationships. You know, everything that you need to know it is God's love letter to us. It allows us to have an intimacy with God, you know, that, that allows us to be with Him each and every day that we read it and study it. It teaches us about Him, all kinds of things. Well, that, that's, that's one side of it. But inside there's also God's law. 
And sometimes what we do is we take God's law, we use it from the aspect of the Ten Commandments. Is there more than just the Ten Commandments in there? It's just, you know, so what we try to do is we have this misunder misunderstanding. Well, here, if you've got my notes or you put it on the screen, Miss Lee, it says this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Do not think that I've came, this is Jesus speaking. Do not think that I've came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest leather or stroke, it's your jot, you know, your, it says in the King James, your, you know, it's got those uh, Hebrew or Greek words in there. We don't know what it means, the Hebrew words. Well, that's what, those, what it says. The smallest letter or the stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So here, we, we, when we start reading that right there, then, we, then we'll say, okay, when Jesus came and he was born, he lived, he you know, showed himself to be the prophet and the king, the savior of the world. He died, he was resurrected, he went to heaven. Has it all been fulfilled? No, just that section of it. So there are still things that are still coming to be fulfilled, meaning that this book is still alive and you and I need to learn how to apply it to our lives today. Even though the last letter was written, or last you know, pen to paper was written some couple thousand years ago, right thereabouts, you know, this book is still just as live because not all of it has been fulfilled. But in the part about salvation, dealing with the law, that has been. So you have to use wisdom and insight. What is God trying to teach us when, when Jesus you know, said this? What is he trying to get us to understand? Well, I got the million dollar question. We always have those, right? The law of God was founded in the Old Testament. Now there I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. And a lot of issues of dealing with the law were found in the Old Testament. But then they were expounded on in the New Testament. It means they were brought to life. There's things that Jesus said. He used the Apostle Paul and John and James and Peter and, and Luke and a lot of men of the Bible that he's used them in the New Testament to expound upon what they learned in the Old Testament to bring forth to help us who come underneath of grace and mercy. But let me ask you a question. Wasn't grace and mercy all the way back to the beginning? See, we think that grace just came around when Jesus died on the cross for us. Didn't God reveal grace and show us grace when, you know, Adam and Eve sinned and then he killed an animal, an innocent animal, and shed that blood and covered their nakedness? Wasn't grace given to Adam and Eve all the way back to the beginning of time? So grace has always been around. And see, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take and we're trying to manipulate. We say, well, the law was written in the Old Testament and we're living under grace, so these things don't apply to us and we have to look at it from a different... Listen, guys, that is not what God said. You need to come and understand it because a lot of times what we try to do is we have these, you know, around the kitchen table discussions and, and we'll say this, well, you know, we're not under law anymore, we're under grace. When did you come out from under the law? We're always under it. You can't get away from it. But it's how you approach it and how you interpret it and how you apply it to your life which makes the difference. So here you go. Here's a question. You know, it says, it says that the law of God was found in the Old Testament and expounded on in the New Testament. Here's the questions. What good are they? What good are the laws? What is their purpose? And do they even apply to us today, especially when Jesus said what he said in Matthew 5, 17, but I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. So how important are the laws to us today? And I'm talking beyond the Ten Commandments. Here's some things of their purposes. The law points to Jesus. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus said unto them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you. While I was alive and while I was walking, we was going up and down the highway together. He says, all these things were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He says, listen, he says, you know, everything that Moses, everything the prophets talked about, all of that from the Old Testament points to me in the New Testament here and now and in the future. 
See, the whole Old Testament, every, listen guys, if you can't find Jesus on every page in this book, you need to re-examine how you read it. Everything from the Old Testament, from Genesis, all the different things from the Ark, all the way from the covenant, you know, the, the things that they did, all the things in the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, Noah's Ark, all these things are symbolic somehow, some way, pointing us to the grace and the mercy and the shed blood and the resurrection and the power and the hope and the trust we have in Jesus Christ. Everything. That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, I try to tell you all, these are my words, that when Moses and the prophets, and they were pinning all this to paper, and they were teaching everybody in the Old Testament, they were all talking about me. Listen, it's all about Jesus. Where is Jesus in your life? How is he, you know, a part of your decision making? Jesus is the guide. Jesus is our instruction. Jesus is our GPS for every area that we make. And it's all backed up by this book right here. Now, I don't have it in my notes, but in John, the Gospel of John, what did he say? In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, right? And it says in chapter uh, 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So here, you know, this whole Bible and everything is about Jesus. And all the things that we use about the law and stuff, it points to Jesus Christ. The law points to Jesus and that salvation is not found in the law. Now see guys, here's what happens. Around the coffee table and things of that nature, we get into these discussions about, you know, how we are supposed to act and live and, and control us and all these things. And we've got this mindset, listen, we've got this mindset that you and I can earn our way into heaven by keeping the law. How can you do that? There's no way. Now, we try to manipulate people and we try to make them think that, you know, that you've got to keep these laws. Well, there's also good laws and bad laws. Have you prayed enough? Have you read enough? Have you studied enough? Have you gone out and shared your faith with others? We ain't talking about murder and rape and all those things. Let's talk about the good things that Jesus has told us to do. Are you doing all those? And then if you're not, you can guess what? You're guilty. You may not be a raper or murderer or a thief or all those things, but you know what? You're guilty by not keeping the good laws as you are as guilty as doing the bad laws. So it puts us in a dilemma. So, you know, we have to go to the law, the book, to understand what it says. It says... The law points us to Jesus and that salvation is not found in the law. John, look what Jesus said in chapter 5. It says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But he says you're looking for the wrong thing. He's talking to the, you know, he's, he's trying to get, get his disciples and all those who are around him. He's got all these Pharisees and all these religious leaders who were all caught up in trying to be obedient to what Moses gave them back in, you know, in the desert and coming through with the, the tent of meeting and all these things. And these Pharisees were trying to make this all an issue and all this. He says, and you are searching the scriptures because he says, what does he say right here? He says, he says, you search the scriptures, he's talking about the law there, so that you may have eternal life. He says, listen, eternal life is about me. Look at what it says. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these that bear witness of me. Where is eternal life found? It's found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in the law. All of the things of the law and the prophet, all of these are the foundation to show us and appoint us to Jesus Christ. Listen, guys, it's all about Jesus. Every bit of it's about Jesus. Now, does that give us the right to go out and do what we want to do? I've accepted Jesus Christ. Now he's my Lord and Savior. I've said the prayer. I've gone through the water. All these things. You know, now I can go out and do what I want to. Paul said, oh, no, absolutely not. God forbid. And then James says, I got it in my notes a little bit later on. James says, if you are truly saved, your works didn't save you, but the Jesus Christ saved you. And if you really truly are saved, then you will work your fingers to the bones for the one who saved you. Then James goes on and says, if you say you're saved and you're not working for him, guess what? You're a liar. 
you don't understand it. You've missed it. You see, so, so we catch ourselves in a catch-22. How is the law? How do we honor it? What does it mean? What, what is it all about? Well, let me show you a couple things. Vital distinctions between... Now look, you need to get those... I, I highlighted those two words. Works of the law and the words of the law. To understand this message and understand what God wants to teach us, you've got to know the difference between those two words. You've got to know the difference between works of the law and words of the law. It's very vital that you understand that because that will give you the understanding about how God wants to use the law from the Moses and the prophets to teach you about Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Listen, as Paul writes this, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified... Did you get that? Do you all see that? Listen, listen, I mean, that's very vital to understand this. Nevertheless, knowing that the man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, since the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, let me give it to you in just good old country hillbilly from Kentucky. You can't work your way into heaven. You're not going to be justified by works. I do not care if you take it upon yourself to go to every house in the state of Arkansas and knock on every door and give them a track and tell them about Jesus. If you give every penny you ever made and raise money by the billions and give it to missionaries all the way around the world. If you go make sure that every child is fed and nobody's naked and you make sure that everybody's taken care of and you meet the physical needs of everybody, you know why? Without Jesus, you're still going to split hell wide open. Thank you for your service. But it ain't going to get... You're not justified by keeping the law. You can't be... Now, listen guys, I'm saying, are we held accountable? Yes! Listen, salvation in Jesus Christ is not a ticket to do whatever you feel like you want to do. But that's where grace and mercy comes in when we're seeking after righteousness and we're trying to do what God wants us to do and we make a mistake and we do something wrong. We ask God to forgive us. We repent of that. He cleans us up, brings us right back into the fellowship with Him like we've never left and then He forgets our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's where mercy and grace comes in. So it's very powerful. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is no way that you can work yourself into heaven. So that's what the Pharisees were doing. That's why the Pharisees got so upset with Jesus and they came together and they crucified him because Jesus says, You come by repentance. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We've already gone through that. Repent, repent. And they said, oh, no, you're changing the whole thing, man. We're all about the law and sacrifice. What saved Abraham? Faith. It wasn't his good works. His faith made him righteous. Faith is what saves us. Look here. It says, our problem as human, it is with works and words of the law. Those two things. Because we are motivators, talk about human beings, that's who we are. We are thinkers, and on top of the animal chain and and self-surviving, it is mentally tough to accept salvation as a free gift for what Christ accomplished on the cross for our sins. See, we, we, we just can't do it. See, listen, you and I have got this mindset. I go to a place and work, what do I want out of that? A paycheck. That's what we work for. So we got this mindset. We go out here and we do something in our yard. We trim the bushes. We hang wallpaper. We paint our house. We do whatever we do. We bake a cake, whatever the case it is. We get something out of it because of our effort and work that we put into it. We get a beautiful dinner, you know, a nice fresh painted room, right? And we look back at it and we say, wow, we get that accomplishment. So we are in this mindset that we must work to do the things to get what we want to accomplish in the earth and we take it over to the spiritual and we think that because we got to work for our fleshly, we got to work for our spiritual. And it's not about what we do, it's about what Jesus did. 
It's powerful. How do we honor God's law? Allow the law to point us to Jesus. How do we honor God's law? God's law will take us and show us how we need to live in our life. If we honor God's law, it will take us and show us the things that we need to do that will bring glory and honor to Him, help us at peace, help us understand what we need to do. Amen? And so we get it all twisted. Oh, He's such a good person. Well, what makes that person a good person? Not because of what he did, but what Jesus Christ did in him and through him. Amen? Look here. It says, it says, it is called, it says, it is mentally uh, tough to accept salvation as a free gift for what Christ accomplished on the cross for our sin. It is called justification. We think if we act and if we do good works and we earn to keep our salvation, but if we are genuinely saved, works will come forth, and that's what the book of James is all about. Well, if you look at page 2 there, I want to show you a couple more things here. Listen, this is very, very... Listen, I put these notes out there so you can have them, all right? Because, guys, you can take this and go back and study it. You know, just me saying it and you got them to read and study, you can go back and see if I'm right. Prove me wrong! I, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm for the challenge. I love it, okay? All right? If you focus on the works of the law, do you see that? I and mean, this is very, you need to get this one. Say amen. You, you listening? If you focus on the works of the law, you will, be dis, you will bring discouragement and false pride. Because see, if you're focusing on, see that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees, you know, they, they wore their clothes, they sat at the head of the table, and they expected to be served and waited on, and all these things. They had this pride idea because they focused on the law, and they understood the law, and they did what they did, and everybody said, wow, look here. Here is the Pharisee of Pharisees. Step aside, let me come through. And here comes Jesus from a virgin, from a carpenter, you know, you know, had nothing and total poverty, if you will, and became the salvation of the world, and they couldn't handle that. He says, it's not about what, you know, what we do here is what, what God is doing. You understand? And, they, and, they, and they, they couldn't handle it. They got so upset about it, they took him to the cross. They said, hey, we'll eliminate him. If we get rid of him, have him killed, murdered, be done with, it's over. But all did they know? It was all in God's plan. Go ahead and take him to the cross because a few days later he's going to come up out of that grave. Wow. How powerful it really is. Now look at the next one. If you focus on the words of the law and of the prophets, it will reveal the beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in this Bible, which I've already said, everything points to Jesus. And when you go back and you study all the, different, all the different typologies and all the different examples, every one of them are a picture somehow, some way. One of these days, I've been sharing with the uh, Sunday night. Y'all miss the Sunday night. That's when we have our biggest time. We let our hair down. I just teach for an hour, and it's fun. It's joking. If you don't know, watch one of our Sunday nights, and you'll see why we have such a good time. I mean, it's just a, you miss the best service of the house on Sunday night. We have fun, don't we? Amen. And it's just really good, just simple and, and easy teaching. But, you know, here, you know, talking about these things of this nature right here, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't, we, we, we get everything all twisted and we get everything all, all, all our mindset and everything is all done and, and, and everything is backwards. And what I was going to say was, you know, when, when we put these notebooks, I put these notebooks together, I mentioned to the Sunday night crowd that I want to do one on the tabernacle. I did one one before. And it ended up being about that thick. Every area of the, of the tabernacle, from the tent pegs to the color of the threads, every one of them is a picture pointing to Jesus. Everything, the way it's laid out, the order of it. Right now we're doing the commands of Christ. Maybe I'll, you know, God, because it's, 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 it's an in-depth study, okay? It don't, you know, I'm not going to copy the one I had. I'm going to make a new one, so I'll I be refreshed my memory. But I'm telling you guys, everything in the Bible, everything that Moses did, the Garden of Eden, everything, the killing of that animal, everything points to Jesus Christ. If you focus on the words of the law and the prophets, it will reveal the beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 5 Verses 46 and 47. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. This is Jesus saying. 
Do you ever find Jesus' name in the Old Testament? You ever hear Jesus, I mean Moses mention Jesus Christ? You don't. Jesus says, everything that Moses wrote, he wrote about me. Focus on the words and not the works, okay? But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Every aspect of the law and the prophet is a beautiful picture of the person of the work of Christ. Look at this next paragraph. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that no one can be saved by the works of the law because we cannot keep the law to the level of perfection that the holy God demands. If you are going to be saved by the law and your faith believes it's saved in works, guess what? You cannot break it once. There's only one person who did that. What was his name? Jesus. None. You can't, you, you can't break it once. So everybody in this room is already guilty. Ain't nobody going to heaven. If you have that theology, you have that mindset, guess what? Nobody is going to be in heaven. Nobody. Show me one perfect person that has done everything right that a holy, righteous God would demand of you if you had to work by works. Show me one. I can show you a lot of good people. I just mentioned two of my sisters. I've never seen such a caring, giving to ladies. The whole family's that way. But ladies, if you don't know Jesus, you ain't going to be in heaven with your brother. This brother. It's just, it's just that simple, guys. You can't write a big enough check. You can't do enough to earn your way into heaven. That's what the Scripture, listen, it says, Scripture makes it abundantly clear that no one can be saved by the works of the law because we cannot keep the law to the level of perfection that a holy God demands. God the Father will accept what God the Son did as a payment for our sin debt, propitiation. We don't use those words because, you know, we, we just don't use them. That is a debt that God will allow. But, you know, I go to a place and to buy something, right? And I say, hey, do you take a debit card? They said, sure. That's going to pay for that transaction, and they're happy and satisfied with it. And today, a lot of them will pull up your account immediately to see if you got it in there. You all know that? They can do that with your checks and stuff. They can do it immediately to see if they're going to get their money. Their, their money is going to be out before you get to the front door. You, their money... Uh, your money is going to be in their account. They got the access to do that today. Immediately. That's what this means. You know, that payment has been paid and it was accepted by who you bought it from. God accepted what Jesus Christ did on the cross as a payment for our sin. Then he justifies us. What does that mean? Justification. When God looks at us, he's going to accept the price. And in our sin nature, he's not going to accept it but he's going to accept it for what Jesus did. He said, you're justified for Jesus, not your works. Does that make sense? It's hard to grab. Jesus Christ is the one who saves us. Why should we honor the law of the Lord? Look, I'm going to give you a couple of things here. Explains how to love. The entire message of Jesus was about how to love God and other people. The law you're asked, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He's not talking about the Ten Commandments here. And, and Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. And then look what Jesus said. Matthew twenty-two forty. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Wow. You understand how important that is? Everything that, everything that, you know, that uh, Moses and the prophets, all of them that you read about, the minor and the majors and everything, everything pointed to Jesus Christ. And this lawyer had to be pretty smart, right? He said, great master, teach me here. What are the greatest commandments? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with everything you got. And then love your neighbor as yourself. All of the rest of the laws hang on this. It's all centered around love. Number two, it teaches us God's wisdom. I gave you some verses there, but I'm not going to read them all. It but I want to read that one. It's in bold there. Psalm 111.10. 10. 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The law shows us that. Look at number three. It draws us to Christ. I gave you a couple of references, but I put in Romans in bold. Romans 8, 3, and 4. For what the law could not do as weak as it was through the flesh, God did, y'all getting this? God did, uh, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but a wa walks according to the Spirit. Oh, guys, listen to me. Listen to me. You all have got family members. You've got brothers and sisters. You all have got neighbors. You all have got co-workers. You all have got people that you're associated with every day. They think that they are going to be saved because they're a good person. They've done good things. I'll help them to see and understand. It defines sin, Romans 7, and I gave you three of them there. It produces good success. Joshua 1, 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Why did Jesus make a reference to Moses' law and prophets telling about a man who went to hell in Luke 19? Y'all know the story. A lot of people say that this is a parable, but it's not. If you do a little bit of research, you will come and see and understand that, the, that the, all the stories and the way it's written, it is not a parable, it's a true story. This is an actual account that took place. A parable has a story with certain meaning. But listen, Jesus said this. He was teaching, he was talking about Abraham. He said there was a, a rich man and a poor man, right? And the, and the rich man died and he went to hell. And the poor man died and he went to heaven. And all, and they, all these things were taking place and, and all these things were happening. And the man that was in hell said, Oh, please, let me, do, let me go and send somebody and do all these things. And Jesus made a reference to the law. He said they've had it all the way from the beginning of time and they didn't listen. Don't be one of those people. Listen. This whole book points to Jesus Christ. Everything. He is the center of God. He is the center of the foundation of everything. He was before he was the one who walked with Adam and Eve. Jesus wrestled with Jacob. Jesus has always been. He just revealed himself in the flesh for us so that he could take on our fleshly nature and overcome it with the power and the grace of God. And then when he went to the cross and died for our sins, he paid the ultimate price. Listen to me, church. Makes no difference if you're rich or poor. Black, white, red, or yellow. Doesn't matter where you're born or where you're at. It has no idea. Listen, I ain't talking about religion here. I'm talking about relationship. What is your relationship with Jesus? You've got, you all, I know you do, I do too. Got loved ones. They get all caught up in that, you know, well, well you know, you've got to be perfect, this and that. And you always got to be crying out to God. Yes, we need to be crying out to God, but you need to understand something. It's all about the relationship with Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. I hope you, I hope you all grab this. Because we've got, the, we've got theologians that are out there. We've got denominations and we've got groups of people. We've got them out there by the thousands that are saying, hey, your salvation depends upon you. And people are either living in fear or they're living and saying, hey, I can't make it anyway, so why even try? Listen to me, guys. Listen. Where are you at with Jesus? Who is he to your life? You can go out here and you can ask someone who's been brought up in a church any way, shape, or form, and they could be laying in the gutter from just total from 
being passed out from drugs or alcohol or whatever, and you can say, do you want to go to a dying, burning hell? And they say, no, I don't want to do that. Well, say this prayer and you'll go to heaven. And there's been a lot of people that's prayed a sinner's prayer. They're not going to make it. Because they prayed it for the wrong reason. There's been a lot of men and women who's walked the aisle of a church and gone through the baptism waters. They ain't going to make it. Because they're doing it for the wrong reasons or they got the wrong idea or the wrong concept. You've got to come to a place where you realize that there is a God and you're not Him. You've got to come to a place that God is the one who created us and God is the way, He is the one who created the way for us to have eternal life with Him. He used the law of Moses and the prophets all to Jesus. Well, preacher, how, how, I don't understand how does this all work. Not too long ago, I preached a sermon about two men. One of them was Esau and the other one was David. Listen to me. Esau just sold his birthright. Now, you don't, if you're not Jewish, which I know you're not, they don't understand, but it was a big deal. Okay? He sold his birthright to his brother because he was starving. He'd been out in the field. He came back and he said, Oh, said, go ahead and just take my birthright. Give me, a, give me a bite of meat. I don't need it. I'm going to die anyway. And so he sold it. In Hebrews it says that he went before the Lord and he repented and he cried alligator tears. And God said no. He did not accept his forgiveness. David, on the other hand, committed murder, adultery, done things that were unspeakable what he did to Kevin, battles, blood all over his hands. And when the prophet came to him about his episode with Bathsheba, when he took that woman, committed adultery, made her step outside of her wedding vows, and then he had her husband murdered, and when he was presented with what he'd done, it said he went and repented before the Lord and cried alligator tears, and God forgave him. Make sure you understand your theology. A man just sold his birthright and was not forgiven, and a man who committed murder and adultery was. Here's the difference. Esau only cared about what was in the flesh. Esau cared about that he lost his inheritance. Esau cared about that he lost all the things that was entitled to him in the flesh while he was alive. And David lost his relationship with God. He said, oh Lord, what I've done has separated me and you. And I want that relationship back and I'm sorry for what I did. And God forgave him. Make sure you understand your theology. I know you got some great mamas and grandmas that taught you a whole lot of things. You know, don't get messed up in grandma's theology. Don't get messed up in some denomination. Don't get messed up with somebody on TV that you love and respect. Don't get caught up in any of those things. Make sure you understand what true theology is. The law, how do we honor God's law? By allowing it to point us to Jesus Christ and help us live the life that God wants us to live. Would you bow your heads, please? Oh, Heavenly Father, this is your time. And so, Father, I just pray for these next few moments that, oh, Father, that you would speak in the hearts of the people. Whatever they're dealing with, whatever they're facing, Lord, whatever decisions they need to make, Father, whoever they need to pray for, I just ask, Lord, that you would just, that you would just speak and that you would guide each and every one. Father, these next few moments, there's a time of where we reflect and we think about what we've learned and heard here today. Lord, I know that I could be preaching about one thing and the Holy Spirit has laid somebody's heart, somebody on their heart, somebody they're thinking about that lives in Little Rock or another state. I know, Lord, I'd be preaching about the law and, and salvation in Jesus Christ and, and, you've, and you've pricked their heart about something else. Lord, only you know what they're dealing with. So for these next few moments, I just ask that everyone here, 
who listens to this on the internet, when it comes time for their, for their altar call, that they would totally and completely just seek you out. Let everything point to Jesus.